If you look back on the first year of the original PlayStation and you scroll through all the games, there aren't that many true blockbuster titles that defined the system. Games that you couldn't play somewhere else. Ridge Racer and Tekken, as impressive as they were to play at home on your TV, they were in arcades for a year or more before Sony's console dropped. Rayman? Well, if you were one of the five people that had an Atari Jaguar, you could play it there. Jumping Flash? You, you don't care about Jumping Flash. Even one of the first Sony-owned developers, Psygnosis, a company that predates the PlayStation itself, was porting Wipeout to competing platforms just in case. But among the few standouts in that first year, is Twisted Metal, the PlayStation brand's second longest-running franchise, a series full of iconic characters and a darker visual motif that helped set the system apart from the sometimes kiddie reputation that games very much still had at the time, and a franchise that even despite being dormant for the past decade, was still one of the very first ones picked when PlayStation jumped more fully into licensing for TV shows and films. And yet this first Twisted Metal game was outright insulted before release, both by Sony's upper brass and independent focus testers. The game was shooed away in favor of developer Singletrack's other PS1 launch standout, Warhawk. That developer, it wasn't even a game developer, but an offshoot of an engineering firm. The game's creative lead? A 24-year-old with only a couple design credits to his name, a dude on his last bit of rope with Sony after having rubbed a few too many folks the wrong way in just a year in change's time. Make no mistake, Twisted Metal was never supposed to be a success, and yet that underdog energy carried it through millions of sales, shock Game of the Year awards, developer changes upon developer changes upon developer changes, and the early stories behind this franchise's production are, in essence, a defining story of how the PlayStation itself came to be. The series' many struggles mirrored Sony's games division's growing pains as it figured out how to be a gaming company, and the series' multiple deaths came at points of intense change, both within Sony and throughout the industry. If you don't know the full story behind Twisted Metal, you do not fully know the story of the PlayStation. So let's fix that. This is the complete history of Twisted Metal. The rise, the fall, and maybe the hope for a resurgence. The earliest beginnings of the Twisted Metal series technically predate the PlayStation itself, at least in terms of release, with the original concept for the game being pitched by three of the very first designers working at what was then known as Sony ImageSoft. Starting around 1987, Sony jumped into the gaming market, at first unknowingly and unwillingly. The father of the PlayStation, Ken Kutaragi, already a decade-plus tenured engineer at Sony, had taken on a contract from Nintendo to produce the sound chip for the Super Famicom, and he did this completely in secret because Sony, funnily, had zero interest in the games industry, actually negative interest in the games industry. When higher-ups found out, Kutaragi was only saved from a swift firing because of Sony's CEO stepping in and saying, nah nah, give him a chance. Nintendo, being thrilled with the cutting-edge sound chip, quickly tossed out feelers regarding a Sony-made CD add-on for the Super Famicom, and even though most Sony executives still turned their nose at what was clearly just a fad and would never end up as the company's biggest profit driver, the company's CEO once again gave Kutaragi his blessing. Many of you probably know the story of the Nintendo PlayStation from that point on. Licensing disagreements led to Nintendo publicly embarrassing Sony by announcing a partnership with Philips the day after Sony unveiled the add-on. Sony's CEO then put Kutaragi in charge of opening up the mother of all spite stores, and the gaming world changed forever. But there's an awkward middle period there, where Sony began publishing and even developing games for the NES, SNES, and even the Sega Game Gear, Genesis, and Sega CD. This would lead to the founding of that aforementioned Sony ImageSoft for publishing games in the US, while in Japan, Sony's record label Epic Records published these early games, including one from HAL Laboratory five years before Kirby, the very first Sony published game, and two games by Pokemon's Game Freak, which later led Game Freak to making a PlayStation exclusive game. I've got a video on that Game Freak stuff if you want to check that out after this, but all this backstory is to give you an idea of what Sony's game division was like prior to 1995, which is to say, there really wasn't one, and how that influenced the Twisted Metal franchise from day one. 
See, those three earliest names that came up with Twisted Metal were producer Alan Becker, who had worked at ImageSoft all the way back in 1990 before moving up through the company over the years, founding and running Sony's Santa Monica studio, and ending up as the head of Sony's Japan studio for the entire 2010s decade before his recent retirement. And designers Michael Guillaume and David Jaffe, who both started in 1993 as testers on games like Cliffhanger. It was purportedly near the end of 1994, just as the PlayStation was releasing in Japan, that this trio visited a legendary computer graphics firm in Utah named Evans & Sutherland in order to broker a games partnership. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to give you that company's full history too, but those two names, Evans & Sutherland, are directly responsible for the precursors to things like modern graphical interfaces and object-oriented programming, essentially everything that your current terminally online existence is based upon, as well as teaching and or employing countless more pioneers that would build off of their work. The founders of Adobe, Pixar, Oracle, Netscape, and the guy who created the idea of a computer desktop, just to name a few. You expected none of this in a Twisted Metal history video, but here we are. While the company focused more on military applications like early VR and flight sims, the meeting with Jaffe, Becker, and Guillaume led to a handful of engineers splitting off and forming a studio named Single Track to develop games exclusively for the PlayStation games like Jet Moto, Warhawk, and of course Twisted Metal. Or, at least that's how the story goes as told by those involved on the Twisted Metal side. See, a lot of these stories seem to sway over time and usually convey that underdog us versus the world energy that fuels this franchise and its creators. Single Track was actually founded anywhere from six to nine months before that meeting took place. Now, a lot of that is hopefully just innocent slips of the mind and memory wavering a bit, especially after years and decades, but this is something that you have to keep in mind when considering a lot of the behind-the-scenes official info about this series. Anyway, Warhawk spawned from the team's flight sim roots, while Twisted Metal spawned after the three reps from Sony returned from Utah. The story goes that one of them, none of them are sure which one, or the story at least changes which one, blurted out in frustration at LA's disgusting traffic that they wished they had rockets strapped to their car so that they could just blow everything out of their way. And Eureka. With Single Track developing both of these games simultaneously for a holiday 1995 release to coincide with the PlayStation's Western launch, Guillaume and Jaffe flipped a coin to decide who would produce what. From here, Becker and Guillaume start to drop a little bit out of this story, with Becker taking on a higher level producer role and quietly becoming one of the most important but least known names in the PS brand's history, with the ninth most game credits in the history of the company. Meanwhile, Guillaume sort of took the flip side of Jaffe's route through Sony. When supervising Single Track, Jaffe took the reins on Twisted Metal, where Guillaume got Warhawk and Jet Moto. When they moved to Santa Monica Studio later on, Jaffe led Twisted Metal Black and God of War, while Guillaume was the creative lead or director on games like Hot Shots Golf, War of the Monsters, and even Parappa the Rapper 2. Alright, we're here, just sitting in the car. I want you to show me if you can get far. Boom, 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 you say bam, bam, bam. That's it, boys and girls! Notice how I said when supervising single track there? Well, part of the reason all this texture is necessary to understanding how Twisted Metal became what it did, and why the game never really broke out sales-wise after the first couple games, is because of the structure behind the series' production. Jaffe, throughout just about his entire run with the games, always referred to the team as the guys uh, from Utah, and that's because he was often directing these games remotely from California, even this far back in the mid-90s. For reference, that's a two-hour flight today, not counting the soul-crushing traffic on the way to and from LAX, so it's a bit of a rogue trip, and you're avoiding it as often as you can, hopefully not going more than once every few weeks. This management structure is the sort of thing that would even be a struggle today in a post-work-from-home world, let alone 30 years ago, and it's the kind of idea that certainly wouldn't have flown in pretty much any other gaming company at the time, except for the one that had the most roundabout entry into games, the one that didn't quite have a structure in place locally, nationally, or internationally, where every studio involved was kind of just doing their own thing with a blank check. And also keep in mind that Jaffe was incredibly new to all of this. He was still in his early 20s, he was only a tester for about a year before becoming a designer on a Mickey Mouse game, before becoming the producer for now one of the most iconic PlayStation franchises ever. And this is where the other father of Twisted Metal starts to come into play, director and producer and co-director and co-everything, Scott Campbell. One of the engineers who split off from Evans & Sutherland to found this new game dev team, Campbell was sort of thrown into a producer role, working day-to-day -day with the team while continually presenting updates to and receiving feedback from Jaffe during what I'm guessing were never-ending conference calls and emails. 
If Jaffe was the general sending out orders from base camp, Campbell was usually the one dishing out commands at the ground level. And, of course, don't forget that single track staff comprised between one and two dozen folks at this time, most of whom were engineers by trade learning game development on the fly by way of Sony's apparently incredibly detailed, but sometimes poorly translated toolsets. Almost everybody on the team in Utah, Campbell included, ended up doing at least some work on both Twisted Metal and Warhawk. Both games were released five days apart in November 1995. In just a 12-month span, the team went from less than scratch to a full codebase that worked across two titles for a system that practically zero studios outside of Japan had yet touched, and they dropped two fully finished games that are remembered fondly decades later. It's frankly up there with some of the most impressive feats that you can point to throughout the history of game development. Funnily, of those two games, it was Twisted Metal that was the red-headed stepchild throughout production. Sony executives were continually wowed by Warhawk, and then in the same breath, somebody like Ken Kutaragi, remember him from earlier? They would ask Jaffe and co. when they were going to put in the real graphics and get rid of the ugly placeholder models and assets. They were not placeholders. What's worse, the focus tests had just as bad a reception, if not worse, than the executives, in part because of what I would argue is one of the fatal flaws that has kind of always held this series back. See, it kind of sounds stupid to say it out loud, but Twisted Metal was designed as if it were a fighting game that just happens to use cars. You can see the clear and outright admitted Mortal Kombat inspiration in the series' darker and edgier tone, and the story's annual tournament impetus, and Twisted Metal 2 even introduced special energy attacks that would use quarter circle styled inputs, like up up left to activate a shield, or left right down to be able to shoot anything behind you at all for some reason. Why not just have a shoot behind you button? I, I don't know. Here with Twisted Metal 1, at the time still going by one of its several early names, either High Octane or Urban Assault or Cars and Rockets, the focus testers were folks like Street Fighter players. So those focus tests were maybe always doomed to fail with this one because it's hard to explain 3D fighting game with cars to people that have never seen a 3D game before to begin with. And yet, despite folks like Jaffe expecting to get laid off right after the game's inevitable failure, Twisted Metal exploded that holiday when it launched, pulling over a million sales in the US alone on a budget of only $850,000. Out of nowhere, it won Electronic Gaming Monthly's 1995 Game of the Year award. Even despite visuals that weren't exactly blockbuster AAA level, players loved the ahead-of-its-time progressive vehicle damage that you would see on your cars as your health dropped down, and the key that seemingly got missed in all of those focus tests, the multiplayer absolutely shined. Where Nintendo Kids had Super Mario Kart's battle mode, the PlayStation came out swinging, aiming for an older market, the kids who had grown up out of the Nintendo ecosystem, and now they would have their own battle mode that was bigger, badder, and full of explosions. The single player, although it was definitely more ignored compared to the countless multiplayer matches that graced dorms and bedrooms around the country, well, the campaign was no slouch either. Although the enemy AI wasn't exactly stellar, it was on par with what you would expect from a 1995 game, and the same could be said for the hilariously bad live-action cutscenes which never made it into the game, directed by Jaffe himself. The story of just about every Twisted Metal game is that this demon named Calypso, who was gifted powers by Satan himself, holds a destruction derby competition every year right around Christmas time, offering the winner whatever prize their heart desires. But it's genie rules here, so the wishes almost always backfire in spectacular ways that get the contest winner killed or maimed unless they have a lawyer look over the terms of the wish first. Which, actually, somehow they never did have a lawyer character that I can think of. Missed, missed opportunity. Anyway, the story is relayed via scrolling text rather than these live-action scenes, and while they're bad, for a 1995 video game, these cutscenes were right in line with the corny and campy stuff you would expect, especially when you realize the mastermind behind the series and the man behind the camera on these scenes wasn't even 25 yet. I couldn't do any better at 25, trust me. Even the developers at Single Track apparently absolutely despised all of these movie scenes because they found half of them a little bit offensive and the rest just outright terrible. Meanwhile, Jaffe loathed the early designs the team came back with when he was first pitching this brooding apocalyptic world because Single Track came back to him with concept art for a pizza delivery game. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on each individual game here, one by one, and the nuances of each one, as much as the general history and the evolution on the production side that doesn't really get talked about much. And this history focus is partly because, honestly, I personally don't really enjoy the games all that much. Like, I went through and beat every single one for the footage for this video, and over time it kind of started to click, but the series 
It's just consistently felt so niched down to appeal to a hardcore within a hardcore that I kind of feel like I'm on the outside looking in. Add that together with the admittedly often funny Genie Wish backfiring thing, which I enjoy far more here in a vacuum when telling you about it, than getting kind of spit on at the end of a full story run through. In short, it's just, it's just not a series for me, and I don't think there's too much that would be productive that can come from me critiquing the finer points of each game when there are far more qualified diehards that can do that far better than I could. Instead, I'll do what I do best here, focus on the history of the games, and talk about how the behind the scenes, and in this case, arguably stuff stubborn core design decisions that led to these games also held the series back from its fullest audience potential. That's not to say that folks involved in production didn't occasionally acknowledge those issues or shortcomings. Go into like stores and watch people play the game on kiosks and, and you know they were banging into walls, they were going too fast, and, and it really wasn't a very pick up and play game. And it's obviously not to say that the games never succeeded, that's just not true. There can't be a fall in this video's title without there being a rise, and Twisted Metal rose so quickly that it launched Single Track and Jaffe into the stratosphere, the rippling after effects of which have kept Jaffe in the cultural Twitter zeitgeist at least to this day. So that's that's something. Within a year of this first game launching, Single Track released two more games, Twisted Metal 2 and Jet Moto. They sold a stake in the company to Microsoft, occasionally cited as Microsoft's first investment deal in the gaming space, and a deal which allowed Single Track to expand even more beyond its now 42 person team. Twisted Metal became one of the first PlayStation franchises to start receiving merch, some that never made it past concepts, but others that released fully like a Tiger Electronics game. And it even got a Japan only PC port for some reason, which featured network play. When Twisted Metal 2 released in November 1996, on the very same day as the studio's other game Jet Moto, interestingly enough, their success only boomed further. Although during production, the team struggled to figure out how to optimize the car combat formula, at one point even considering moving to maybe a mission-based story approach, or hover cars to address the vehicle control issues, they found a strategy that still stuck to its guns. The end result flew off shelves, nearly doubling the first game's American sales. Beyond just control improvements, the darker, muddier visual design of the first game was replaced with a far better looking and more vibrant in-your-face approach to match the series' moxie. The series mascot Needles Kane, known by his car's name Sweet Tooth, replaced a more generic clown style with his now iconic flaming head design. The game absolutely achieved something closer to that necessary balance that every multiplayer game needs to thrive, that balance between depth for core diehard players and a more pick up and play base for the casual audience. And a year after release, just like with the first game, it even got an online enabled PC port, this time available in the US. It turns out Sony's been doing that whole PlayStation exclusive for a year then PC thing a lot longer than we all remembered. However, there's one iconic part of this game's aforementioned moxie that maybe backfired a little. One of the earliest level designs pitched for this game was a battle throughout the streets of Paris, which would feature an easter egg in the form of a destructible Eiffel Tower. When you blew the landmark up, it would open a whole second level, letting you drive up onto and battle on top of the city's rooftops, using pieces of the destroyed tower as bridges and ramps. It's a fucking sick level, for the record. The first time when I was going back through these games with a fresh perspective, where everything started to click again. But it turns out that some folks in the French press, no relation, took offense to the nation's most iconic visage being turned to scrap. The Independence Day movie that featured the complete destruction of essentially every major city on Earth came out five months before this game. Just, just saying. Now, while offending people became something of a rallying cry for the game, as single track drove to create more iconic landmarks just so they could blow them up and piss people off, I guess, it's maybe indicative of that classic loud American tone that the rest of the world knows and, uh, loves? Although the games performed well here in the homeland, internationally, something just never did click. Twisted Metal has consistently flopped everywhere else outside of North America to the point that most of the rest of the series after Twisted Metal 2 never released outside of North America. This was fine for now while Sony was just writing checks and not really paying attention, but as game development grew ever costlier, well, maybe it was the edgy, in-your-face tone set next to the marginally more innocent 1990s that turned people outside of the US off to games like Twisted Metal. But Mortal Kombat held up just fine outside of the states before, during, and after. Maybe it was purely indicative of another one of those regional culture gaps that tended to exist more often in the early internet age, not unlike the Tony Hawk games riding a mostly American skateboarding craze.
Maybe it was all the cars having the driver's side on the left instead of the right, but that wouldn't explain Axel here. Whatever the case, Twisted Metal had to survive solely on American buyers, and to some extent that meant its future was always a bit limited. It would also have to survive without its developer. Single Track's upper staff wasn't exactly thrilled with the royalty shares it was receiving from its PlayStation partnership, and so, after an attempt to rearrange the existing agreement failed, in 1997 the developer cut ties and went rogue. Early in the year, the company had sold a partial stake to Microsoft in exchange for future PC games, before signing a deal to develop N64 games a few months after that, and then a few months after that, the company was entirely sold to publisher GT Interactive. That last part would later cause issues and kill those PC development plans, because Microsoft and GT disputed who had the rights to what, but Singletrack eventually did release a shooter for Windows for Microsoft in 1998 named Outwars. They would never make an N64 game, though. All of this shifting meant two things. That Single Track couldn't develop Twisted Metal games since Sony owned the IP, and that Sony couldn't develop real Twisted Metal games since Single Track owned the codebase. In 1997, Single Track released an underwater submarine combat game in the style of Twisted Metal named Critical Depth, setting the stage for a showdown the following year between Sony's Twisted Metal 3 and Single Track's own car combat game, Rogue Trip Vacation 2012. Now, although Rogue Trip is clearly not a Twisted Metal game in name, its place in the series' history can't really be glossed over. See, although Twisted Metal 3 sold comparably to the first game, as did 1999's Twisted Metal 4 after it, the complete from-nothing approach the new in-house Sony developers took wasn't the only overhaul. That developer, a now-defunct group known as 989 Studios, acted kind of ironically as Sony's proto-Santa Monica Studio, an incubation team of sorts that would assist with production of different games like Siphon Filter, Jet Moto, even the first two Twisted Metals. The team repurposed an engine it had developed for a Rallycross video game, but it only had about eight months to go from that engine to its November release. What's more is that despite initial claims by Sony that David Jaffe would still lead the project with the new team since he was a Sony employee, not a single-track one, he was, by all accounts, not involved whatsoever, outside of one or two early meetings where he gave some tips as the team got started. He instead went off to head up direct, in-person development for the first time in his career, rather than producing remotely or via constant plane rides, on an overhead shooter that was ultimately cancelled after an expensive production that, by his account, was sort of doomed from the start. So without essentially anybody behind the wheel that had worked on the first two games, Twisted Metal 3 ran into a myriad of fundamental issues that similarly doomed it from the start. From wonky physics in part thanks to that repurposed engine, to frankly, kind of boring level design that removes a lot of the fun easter eggs and the interesting verticality that 2 especially had had, even down to the interesting but kind of funny dichotomy between a brighter visual approach than even 2 had, down to even almost cell shaded looking FMVs, stacked up against a Rob Zombie soundtrack. Doesn't really, doesn't really quite work too well. The game still sold well on name alone, and it even seemed to utilize characters and ideas from the design documents of those first two games that hadn't made the cut, but the core Twisted Metal audience outright don't consider these to be Twisted Metal games. In fact, even documentaries produced on Sony's dime kind of shit all over these games pretty frequently, and instead players consider Single Track's Rogue Trip as the true third game in the franchise. Plus, they did that really stupid thing where the second game in the series had the number two, but then the third one decided to use Roman numerals, and uh, on, on principle, I just have to knock off fake internet points for that alone. I mean, just, just pick a lane, guys, come on. However, despite having some cool innovations and additions to the formula in its own right, Rogue Trip also didn't quite get the job done. The game is clearly far more optimized than the first two Twisted Metals were, allowing for better visual effects for explosions, more destructible environments, a brand new dynamic AI system that learns from the player, essentially a bunch of marketing buzz that, sure, it's kinda there, but really it just meant they made bigger levels that ended up feeling a little bit emptier as a result. To help fill out those larger levels, Rogue Trip introduces almost a proto-crazy taxi element to the game. See, instead of some genie giving a free wish to the winner of an explodey shooty car tournament, this post-apocalypse features rich tourists that want to live on the edge, and so they pay mercenaries to drive them around and take photos of various landmarks in each level. The passive income that you earn from driving a passenger around can then be spent to upgrade your weapons, replenish your health, and earn extra lives, and having to chase down opponents to stop them from earning too much money is a pretty neat tweak on the car combat formula, even if it is admittedly a bit underbaked. 
Plus, it's just nice to see some new modes and weapons finally. The Twisted Metal series really kind of just sticks to a handful of the same game modes and power-ups for pretty much the entire series run, and so seeing a mode where you have to look at specific things is kind of cool. I would have liked a King of the Hill mode or something like that. I, I don't know, I think there's more variety that you could add to these games that just barely ever gets done until the very end. Unlike Twisted Metal 3, Rogue Trip had a smooth dev cycle, actually finishing production well ahead of schedule and allowing the game to release a month before TM3 rather than potentially going directly head-to-head. -head. GT Interactive threw millions of dollars and a full marketing blitz behind it, too. Even on the game's box art, they try to sell it as from the creators of Car Combat, which kind of just tickles me. It seemed to at least make back its production costs, but without the Twisted Metal brand behind it, it didn't really have legs. I think today, when Rogue Trip is mentioned in discussions about the Twisted Metal franchise, it tends to be in that hipstery kind of way, where people just want to feel special and get cool boy points for knowing it exists, rather than having actually played it all that much. And I can say that for the record, this game has been in my house for like 20 years for some reason, and I've known that it's been kind of mid that entire time. Really, I think when people compare both of these quote-unquote Twisted Metal 3s, they kind of miss the deeper point. Neither of them really thrive. They both lack inspiration, a unified direction. The two Twisted Metal games made by 989 Studios feel very much like they're directed creatively by folks that understand the surface level of the series and characters, but instead of leaning into the all these people are insane part, it's played more for laughs. Rogue Trip, meanwhile, has pretty generic characters. Shout out to Dick Biggs, though. Great, great name. And it moves away from the grungier soundtrack, the figurative grunge, not the actual genre, and instead chooses... Ska? For some reason? For better or worse, neither game succeeds without an auteur-esque vision behind it. As much as the appeal of the Twisted Metal franchise, at least to a significant chunk of the core fanbase, is the brooding undertones, the lore, the stories, it at least had direction and intent behind it. These are both just video games, and if Twisted Metal were just a video game, it wouldn't be this beloved, nostalgic brand that kept getting shots despite middling to decent sales a lot of the time. It wouldn't be getting Funko Pops and merch. It wouldn't be one of these select few PlayStation properties that's being licensed out into a full TV show or movie. I may not vibe with David Jaffe's tonal decisions personally, and I may not care for his philosophies on game design. Hell, I was never really all that fond of the early God of War games all that much either. Don't, don't tell, that's a story for another video. Subscribe, this is all I have. But at least there was a vision. You can't, as a video game or media property, stay in people's minds for decades and decades without a vision, and a guy who by his own admission pisses off his bosses so frequently wouldn't have gotten so many second and third chances in this industry without a vision either. Rogue Trip also marks the point in this story at which the phrase, a bunch of people got mad and left, occurs for the second of approximately 17 times throughout the series' lifespan. About six months after Rogue Trip released, Scott Campbell and a number of other single-track employees decided to leave the offshoot company, founding Incognito Entertainment in May 1999. In what's either the greatest coincidence in the modern gaming era, or the greatest under-the-table deal in the modern gaming era, the very same month, Alan Becker, one of those three original guys who was in the car when the idea for Twisted Metal was formed, was promoted away from his role at 989 Studios to found Sony's Santa Monica Studio, becoming Sony Computer Entertainment America's Director of Product Development. And wouldn't you know it, Becker looped David Jaffe and Mike Guillaume, the other two dudes from that same car ride, into helping open Santa Monica Studio at the exact same time. We'll come back to that development in a bit, though. First, we have to go back to 989 Studios very briefly to talk about the disaster that was Twisted Metal 4. Developed across about a year, which was split up into two notable phases, six months of normal production from November 1998 to May 1999, oh hey, look, there's that same date again, huh? Followed by six months of exceptionally crunchy overtime, weekends, the works, the best way that I can describe this game is that it's the new generation era of the WWF. Everything that worked prior was completely thrown out the window in order to make way for a bunch of awful new characters whose entire personality is just based on their occupation. There is a pizza boy that's also kind of just vanilla ice. Series staple character Grimm is no longer a sort of a kind of maybe the actual Grim Reaper, but he's instead a pirate. There's a meter maid, a garbage truck, a leprechaun, a pest control van. Hell, Sweet Tooth doesn't even have his real name anymore. He's just an ice cream dealer. What, what, do, we, what do we call those? Ice cream seller? Ice cream dispenser? Ice cream delivery guy? Creamer? I I'm gonna go with Dealer. I like Dealer a lot. We're going with Ice Cream Dealer. There's even a rock singer. Oh wait, that's... 
that's just Rob Zombie. He's just straight up playable now after having a song featured in Twisted Metal 3, so uh, at least that's kind of neat. And you can even create your own custom car. Which, actually, that's the worst thing about this game to me. Not the custom car itself, but that it actually added a bunch of new weapons, vehicles, and ideas, and they greatly improved the mechanics from the weaker Twisted Metal 3, and even though it wasn't exactly as good as Twisted Metal 2, it was a sign that they were moving in the right direction. Actually, wait, no, the worst thing about 4 is that it went back to numbers after 3 used Roman numerals. Just, just pick, a, pick a lane, guys. Seriously. It's still not stellar. There are still control issues, and the larger, more open level designs here end up having you meander around too much to name just a couple core problems, but it's fine. It did tell me to prepare for the bedroom, though, and I, I, don't, I don't like that one. Don't like that one bit. Nope. And to be fair, 3 wasn't a bad game either. It just wasn't great if you already had a pre-existing notion of what Twisted Metal was. 4, though, is awful in that regard, completely replacing the prior narrative structure of Twisted Metal. Instead of Calypso being the one that holds the annual competition, now it's Sweet Tooth, and he's surrounded by a bunch of smaller, sweet teeth. Also, Sweet Tooth's Spokes Tooth is voiced by John St. John, aka Duke Nukem, or your father. Actually, Vanilla Ice Pizza Man here is voiced by Ryan Drummond, former voice of Sonic the Hedgehog himself. You know what? No, no, we're, we're done here. If I look any further down this rabbit hole, I swear to God I'm gonna snap. Speaking of snapping, that's kind of the motif of the next Twisted Metal game, 2001's Twisted Metal Black, the first M-rated game in the franchise, a game focused around an insane asylum, a game that leans so heavily into a dark and sadistic tone that its entire story was removed in Europe. Even in the official documentary video made to celebrate the series' history, they had to bleep Jaffe merely talking about one of the story beats that was cut from all versions of the game, featuring an insane priest drowning a... You know, I... I don't even know that I can say this on YouTube without risking my ad revenue here, so let's just say that the priest thought he was performing an exorcism, but it was actually a baptism. Yeah, yeah. even Sony, who had just cut him a blank check to develop whatever game he wanted, resulting in a game that didn't come out, and who immediately after this game gave Jaffe full creative control and another blank check to develop what would become God of War, even they were like, no, dude, absolutely not. What the fuck? A lot of times you think that when someone has these kind of ideas, you're thinking, are they trying too hard to be edgy and cool and not nerd-like, or... Do they really kind of think this way? And it really became obvious that in the case of David Jaffe, there really is some uh, deep, dark, evil motivations that kind of, I think, spark his, uh, his imagination. First, though, let's jump back to what happened between Twisted Metal 4 and this game. 4 once again performed well enough, despite only, once again, coming out in North America. However, for the second year in a row, it failed to score well. In 98, TM3 was a distant third place behind Rogue Trip and Activision's car combat game Vigilante 8, and 4 didn't hold a candle to Vigilante 8's sequel. However, the Twisted Metal name and the in-house Sony branding and marketing machine was enough to carry the game above all competitors, killing Vigilante 8 after that second game sales just couldn't hold up. 989 Studios, from this point on to its closure a few years later, developed a bunch of sports games. They were Sony's in-house sports developer, having seemingly been gutted in the founding of Santa Monica Studio. What was left of Singletrack, a company that not four years prior was a rising star that went from not even existing to being the premier PS1 studio that practically launched the system, well, it shut down in 2000, and from May 1999 to early 2000, the employees that left Singletrack to found Incognito began negotiating with Sony on a partnership. All the while, Santa Monica began working on an in-house codebase for its PlayStation 2 games. This engine would be named for the first game that utilized it, 2001's futuristic racing game Kinetica, and this engine would go on to be modified and continue to be used in other Santa Monica games like Twisted Metal Black and God of War, and it's also mistakenly cited all the time as the engine for a bunch of other games like Jack, Ratchet, Sly, and SOCOM simply because some random kid said it on a forum once like 15 years ago. Jack and SOCOM, fun fact, started production before Santa Monica Studio existed. All these West Coast studios were just simply friendly and would casually chat about their discoveries while developing for the new console for which nobody knew how to develop yet. Funnily enough, Twisted Metal Black actually came out before Kinetica, despite utilizing some of that game's tech, releasing in June 2001. Although it didn't launch with online multiplayer, a year later players could order an online-only version of the game for free via a mail-in form, at least as long as you bought the PS2 network adapter and lived in America. Otherwise, you had to pay for it. Great. It did come with two other game modes unavailable in the base game, though, a manhunt mode and collector, where you would try to hoard artifacts and take artifacts from other players. 
This is at least better than the original release, where once again the only local offerings are limited to the story mode, deathmatch, and last man standing. The story mode is removed in the online version though, so it's kind of kind of give and take. I would say this is the first time Twisted Metal had online multiplayer, but those two PC ports of 1 and 2 would then try to fight me. Upon release, Twisted Metal Black received mostly critical acclaim, in part targeted at the darker story, the polished gameplay that mostly refined the series' formula. In my opinion, I would call it maybe playing it safe, but that's also what most next-gen entries into prior-gen franchises tend to be, so of course it's a little safe mechanically. Credit to the fine reviewer at Playboy Magazine for saying the game was fun for the whole family. I'm, I'm sure they would know. The game is a lot of fun, and as a technical showcase, it's sort of what you might feel Twisted Metal could have always been. So many levels have a big, massive set piece like before, but now they're more kinetic. A ferris wheel rolling down a hillside suburb and destroying everything in its path, for example. The destruction is amped up to another level, with these armor-plated cars able to destroy entire houses and buildings simply by driving through them. It's wonderful. I also just have to shout out for one second that it's not like most games even today where you can tell which parts of the environment or which walls can be destroyed because they just kind of stick out a little bit. Here, everything fits in, and it's on you to ram stuff yourself to figure it out. A lot of the levels are maybe a bit too large for what they are, and the game still plays it safe with modes and new item pickups and the enemy AI never really quite doing enough damage to each other, so it's more like you're fighting a 1v7 instead of a free-for-all, but hey, whatever, the multiplayer is where it's at for most players anyway. What's interesting is that the focus, at least on Jaffe's part, was no longer the gameplay. With Twisted Metal Black, the series once again sold well in the US, although surprisingly to this point, it marked the worst performing game in the franchise even here selling just under a million copies in its first five years on the market. You'd expect a big launch window title for the PS2 to perform a little bit better than that, right? Especially for, at the time, a tentpole franchise? Well, a number of folks on the team, including Jaffe himself, looked back on the more sinister tone as perhaps what's at fault here. I had gotten bored of the mechanics of the series, and so what I was in love with on Twisted Metal Black was the world. The game's promotional videos referenced movies like Sisevenin as inspiration, that's by the way how it's pronounced, don't google it, with so much focus on this game being outright disturbing. And that's not my analysis or editorialization, the word disturbing was the goal. Sweet Tooth went from a normal creepy clown guy to an actual serial killer horror movie villain type. The writing had to tiptoe a bit around calling the priest, well, a priest to avoid US controversy. I already mentioned that in Europe the story was essentially totally removed, even the loading screen text. And Sony, according to Jaffe, was on board with pushing for this darker tone even as everybody involved was forced to navigate the pitfalls and tweaks. And although the game did surprisingly avoid most of those headlines you'd probably expect to see from a violent game in the early 2000s, although critics praised the tone, Jaffe and co. have in retrospect considered it maybe a missed opportunity not to have gone safer for a more T-rated experience that could have hit a wider audience and launched the series to further heights. You can even see this when you go back and revisit the game's contemporary reviews. A lot of love was aimed at the dark storylines featuring all of these disturbed, escaped asylum inmates. Storylines that, mind you, are almost exclusively told via that loading screen text outside of the intro and outro scenes for each character. And the game got praised for the darker visual style, full of gritty or dirty locales, lots of brown and gray tones, oppressive rainstorm effects that would blur your vision. But only a year later, reviews of the online release started giving the game flack for many of these very same things. We kind of tend to forget looking back that the jump from PS1 to PS2 came with yet another tonal shift. Black was tough because we knew we were getting the series back, me and the guys in Utah, and we knew we weren't relevant anymore. We knew that the industry had moved on, we knew that sort of what was edgy and cool in 1994, five and six was no longer edgy and cool in 2001. Considering that a game like Grand Theft Auto 3 changed the landscape later in this same year and pushed developers to focus even more on those mature themes, it wasn't a bad gambit to go for, but it didn't quite pay off. Of course, GTA would change more than just the tone of gaming, by forcing almost everybody in the industry to consider open-world elements a necessity, a fact that would end up partially responsible for the death of Twisted Metal Black's sequel. But before we can get to that, we have to go... back to the PS1? Where Black went for the darkest possible tone, another part of the Incognito team spent some time making Twisted Metal Kids. 
That was the early title, too. It was eventually changed to Twisted Metal Small Brawl, but this game dropped in November 2001, a way to target the younger audience that was maybe left behind on PS1, the kids who perhaps didn't get a PS2 for Christmas, or at least that was the eventual goal. At first, this was another PS2 game before the team thought it best to maybe not release two competing Twisted Metal games on the PS2 six months apart. Despite the name and the target audience, it's rated T. And following an ever-so-brief return to the European markets with Black, Small Brawl once again limited its release to only the US due to sales concerns. This game is, uh, it's not, it's not all that good. The game goes the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids route, putting you inside playgrounds, kitchens, tree... tops? Oh god, no, not again. And other slice of life style levels. Honestly, there are some neat ideas here, including a can opener hazard in the kitchen level that'll suck you up and damage you if you get too close to the magnet. Credit where it's due, I actually kind of love the final boss idea. This arena based in a ghost movie theater of sorts, where you fight ghost variants of the regular vehicles you fought throughout the story mode, which after being defeated will morph together into this boss truck named Piecemeal that you have to damage again so that he breaks back up into fewer and fewer cars. <laughs> Look, plumber's crack. What did you just say? I said... Oh. Oh. After Small Brawl, players would have to wait four more years for the next entry in the franchise, 2005's Twisted Metal Head On, a launch title for the PSP and the game that I honestly feel was the most fun I had during my time with the series. As Jaffe was busy with God of War during this game's production, and actually in a funny twist of fate, Head On would release only two days after God of War, this would be developed pretty much exclusively by the team in Utah and was directed by Scott Campbell. Shortly after the online version of Twisted Metal Black was finished, Sony acquired the developer, making it a full first-party studio and giving the team maybe a bit more stroke than they would have otherwise had as an independent team working under contract. Head On would officially retcon 3 and 4 from the Twisted Metal lore, acting as the direct sequel to 2. If you're curious about the Twisted Metal lore or timeline or anything like that, Twisted Metal Black is essentially Sweet Tooth slash Needles Kane's fever dream, and the PS3 game doesn't exactly relate to the earlier games either, so between those, the now retconned 3 and 4, a completely different timeline and small brawl, and I'm sure I'm forgetting something else in here, not even counting the show, we've got more timelines than Zelda up in this bitch. Gimme Tooth of the Wild next, thanks. Anyway, Head On brings back just about every vehicle from Twisted Metal 2. It calls back to some of the characters and endings of those games, because there are in fact canonical winners in most of these games, whose wishes and interactions with our favorite genie Calypso can drive other characters' stories in later games, and Head On even remakes a couple levels like the infamous Paris one. The new levels are no slouch either, they fit right in with these remade levels, and that's honestly saying a lot because those remakes are obviously going to be some of the most beloved or overall best levels the series has ever seen. A massive level like Tokyo does a stellar job of being big without necessarily feeling empty, thanks to the way that you're funneled through the destroyed freeway roads that loop around and take you back to the city center. That level in particular just especially stuck out to me as did the boss fights, a multi-phase boss fight against a giant RV full of rednecks, where you're also swarmed by more of the family riding motorcycles, where you have to defeat the RV by taking out each enemy that pops up from the windows, or Twisted Metal 2's final boss, Darktooth returning, but this time turning into a giant moving car tower for his second phase just because? It's incredible, and the game is the right mix of over-the-top goofy fun, a good reset after a game like Twisted Metal Black sort of sapped away all the color. And honestly, also a good call considering not all early PSP adopters were going to be old enough to buy another M-rated Twisted Metal. It's admittedly by and large a far easier game, in part thanks to the ability to stack semi-permanent upgrades as you go through each story run, as well as thanks to these... let's, let's go with interesting minigames that are hidden in a teleporter in every level. So as you defeat enemies, occasionally they'll drop one of these upgrades that will carry on throughout the rest of the run so long as you don't get destroyed. And these upgrades are substantial, so you've got a reason not to just waste a life if you're low on health. As for the minigames, I think that they're maybe a little shoehorned in, but they're still fun, and they'll reward you with extra ammo or more upgrades. Some of these are little obstacle courses or challenges forcing you to destroy enemies with specific weapons, actually kind of a good way to train you with a weapon like the Napalm Toss, a rare bit of in-game practice or tutorializing that the series up to this point really has not tried to do. I always felt that was a bit strange given that it was designed as a pseudo-fighting game, so at least this was a step forward towards trying to make it easier for new players to get involved, and reaching more than just the slowly diminishing die-hard fanbase is definitely a good thing to do to keep a series alive. 
Now you may notice that as time is going on, I'm talking a little more about each game, and that's because with each new entry, I start to find a little more that I dig, some little or maybe long needed improvements, the kind of quality of life fixes I've been asking for that wouldn't have been out of the question back in the day. And I'm sure to some extent that as I marathon these games, my natural improvement would have gone a distance towards making me either see more of the magic or something like that, although it wasn't like I struggled with the early games either. What I'm saying is, even though these are clearly not substantive, nuanced breakdowns of each game that I'm going for here, I think it's important as we go through the history behind them to note that, yeah, 10 years in, the series found small ways to keep improving, that even when there were stumbles or, in my opinion, maybe a stubborn resistance to adding or changing things from that first instance of, oh yeah, this works, let's just never touch it again, the series wasn't just stagnant. The games are certainly at many points products of their era, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they couldn't work in the modern era. And in Head On's case, there was strong evidence that the studio developing it could make it work without the thematic direction provided by the series creator. And while we're talking about games very clearly of their era, before Head On, there was meant to be one other Twisted Metal project that never exactly saw the light of day, until Head On's 2008 PS2 version, that is. Inside this Extra Twisted Edition was a full documentary of sorts, featuring interviews with the formative players behind production. Funnily, 3 and 4 get acknowledged more than Small Brawl does here, oops. As well as playable snippets of what's referred to in-game as Twisted Metal Lost. Also known as Twisted Metal Harbor City, and at one point in production referred to as Twisted Metal Black 2, Jaffe wrote up this kayfabe explanation that the game was cancelled because six key staffers died in a horrendous skiing accident. The alleged true reason behind its cancellation, though, was that Sony producers felt that in an immediately post-GTA world, a violent car combat game without an on-foot element might struggle with an ever-changing audience. What's more interesting is that Twisted Metal Harbor City didn't actually get canned until after Head On released, with alpha builds as late as August 2005 having surfaced online. Harbor City directly addressed that industry-wide feeling that every game needed to become GTA by creating the series' first, and currently only, although it doesn't really exist, but we'll say only, full open world, using a fictional analog of Seattle with a bunch of levels all interconnected by a highway system. Later on, an on-foot platforming element was added that would have had players escaping the asylum as needles, once again attempting to follow the overwhelming industry trends of the era. In the bonus features section of Head-On's PS2 port, you can play a supposed quote-unquote early build of this Twisted Metal Lost, featuring this very unfinished on-foot area instead packed full of concept art and behind-the-scenes snippets of info. From what I've gathered, this was such a late addition to Harbor City's development that it essentially was shoehorned in to make the game's alpha date to avoid cancellation, but it was already too little too late. The other part of this Twisted Metal Lost bonus game package thing is a short mini-campaign that was actually closer to a ground-up mini-production that just happens to use levels from Harbor City, but essentially with all new gameplay. Most notably, the series finally just gave up and has you pressing the D-pad to initiate the energy attacks, thank god! Well, sort of, it's actually hold triangle and then press one of these buttons, but that's a lot easier than entering the goddamn Konami code to shoot backwards. The left button drops a mine, up is the freeze missile, down is the rear fire, and right is shield. I actually played this lost part first before I played head-on, so ever so briefly I thought that head-on would also control this way, and I was, I was very quickly very sad. This whole thing is very obviously unfinished, but the levels are so inspired, featuring a suburb with a fully enterable bowling alley and movie theater, an awesome carnival level where you can go down a lot of the attractions like a sort of roller coaster ride, a shipping boat dock, and on top of all of this, you're now told how much damage you deal per attack directly on screen. You're not instantly killed if you fall into a bottomless pit. It's just a lot of fun. And even if the true version of Harbor City likely wouldn't have been quite as good, you can't help but lament at what might have been. But with the team seemingly having done everything it could ever want to do with the Twisted Metal franchise, where would things go from here? It, it's, it's run its course.
In fairness, in this very same documentary, there's a teaser for Twisted Metal coming to PS3, so that comment there is tongue-in-cheek, I'm sure. However, the PS3 Twisted Metal game wasn't going to be on its way soon, exactly. Players would have to wait another four years after Head-On's PS2 release for the series to hit the next PlayStation, in part thanks to another lengthy string of production hiccups and changes. And this is where the story starts to get a little bit blurry, as there are competing sources of information, neither side of which I was able to fully corroborate. See, there's yet another studio shift here, as in July 2007, Scott Campbell and most of the team at Incognito left Sony's clutches to found another new company, Eat Sleep Play, along with Jaffe himself, also leaving his role at Sony Santa Monica at the same time. Although by escaped Sony's clutches, I mean, the new studio comprised of developers from the old studio immediately signed a multi-game, multi-year deal with Sony anyway, including for a new Twisted Metal game. That deal was meant to be either for three games or three years of development, and Twisted Metal 2012 was the only game ever produced under that deal, although Eat Sleep Play did also handle the PS2 version of Head-On separate from that deal. Just to quickly close the door on Incognito, it did in fact stay open for a little bit longer, and was responsible for both the 2007 Jaffe-directed digital download-only car combat game Calling All Cars right before his departure from the studio, as well as the new Warhawk game later in that same year, following in the studio's single-track roots of doing both Warhawk and Twisted Metal. That's, that's kind of cool. Incognito technically still existed until closing in 2009, when the team at that studio also left Sony to found Lightbox Interactive. And they, too, immediately signed their own multi-game, multi-year deal with Sony, which led to the release of Warhawk's spiritual successor, Starhawk, before functionally closing down right around that game's release, too. 2012 was just a graveyard for technically independent studios working under contract exclusively on Sony games. That's it's really fun. Uh, for, a, for a more fun, less sad fun fact than that, Warhawk 2007's director, who also worked on Starhawk, is now a VP at Retro Studios working on Metroid Prime 4. Kind of cool. Now, moving on to Eat Sleep Play and the PS3's Twisted Metal game, which went through a handful of different incarnations before settling on what we got. For the first several months, the game was aiming for a more, and I quote, urban Twisted Metal experience that would sort of style itself based on underground street gangs as depicted in, for example, the Fast and Furious movies, with cars that would appear more like something that you might actually be able to see on the road rather than these armored-up Mad Max cars. The gang part of that idea would end up sticking, although not directly. After that, director David Jaffe briefly wanted to go for a full apocalypse style with a bunch of destroyed landmarks and whatnot before Scott Campbell and presumably others in Utah noted that they weren't really fans of that idea. Although I would argue even then that sort of style stayed in the game too, given that the game often takes place in dusty cities or towns that can feel kind of abandoned or ghosty. It runs into the same problem that both Twisted Metal Black did and that a bunch of mid to late 7th generation games did, in that this game really relies on muddy colors. Now, more importantly than any of the stylistic choices, this game initially started its life as a downloadable, multiplayer-only PSN title so that it could aim for a smaller budget and a lower price point. See, the team at Eat Sleep Play wasn't entirely sure that they could produce a title worthy of a $60 price tag given the continually growing graphical requirements and the consistent issue reaching an audience outside of the US, an issue they also hoped to rectify by making a more thematically accessible title, hence that Fast and Furious idea. However, a decent chunk of the way into the game's full production, it morphed into a $40 still multiplayer-only experience that would get a retail release at Sony's request, before Sony eventually then requested further that a campaign be included and that the game go for that full-price, full-budget standard, in part because so many fans loved the story and the universe. Despite sales concerns on the dev side, according to Jaffe, Sony's market research had to have indicated that it was worth scaling up and taking the risk, that there was some sort of money to be made there. It was, sadly, however, a bit late in the game to create a super satisfying solo experience, and what resulted was a three or four hour campaign that serves pretty much as just a primer for what's meant to be an incredibly deep team battle multiplayer experience, with a story tossed in that maybe appealed more to fans of Twisted Metal Black than others. I'm talking Sweet Tooth is just straight up a serial killer and you watch him stab his family. He does, he does death things to his entire family and somehow set his entire head on fire forever. So I actually spoke to a therapist about this. And that's your first protagonist in a three-chapter story that follows only three playable drivers, each of whom run their own gang in both the single-player and multiplayer modes. 
All three of these characters, Sweet Tooth, Dollface, and Mr. Grimm, have a story from their perspective that ends with them fighting one of the other three in a massive spectacle of a boss fight before getting to Calypso and having their wish granted, with a twist as always that usually got them killed. It's not the most compelling campaign, but it did give a good primer for all of the different modes that the game adds. It mostly ramps up in difficulty fairly, with maybe one exception of a mission that's just an absolute bitch to do, and it also has these, honestly, kinda hilarious live action but the entire set is green screen story scenes that show a lot of the gory details and lead to this kind of just coming off as another Twisted Metal game, the kind of which never really appealed to the audiences in Europe, so... Uh, mission failed on that front, huh. But the intended meat on this game's bone was always the online multiplayer, which aimed for this massive team-oriented approach. Think Overwatch or Team Fortress 2, but with different classes and types of cars, all spread across a handful of sprawling maps, massive maps that are big enough that there was finally another new weapon pickup for the first time in pretty much forever, a sniper. The simple D-pad controls for the shield and other energy attacks return, thank god. There are a variety of default guns on top of the usual Gatling machine gun, stuff like a shotgun or a magnum, and some of the special vehicle-specific weapons are so damn satisfying. The feeling I got when I first popped a wheelie on the motorcycle to ignite the chainsaw weapon and then watched an enemy in front of me just completely explode as soon as I threw it at them? A plus, maybe my favorite overall moment across my dozens of hours with these games in the last couple months. Hell, there's even a somewhat comprehensive tutorial set for this game. Pretty much all of my issues from the prior games get addressed directly here. Now, the online servers, of course, have been taken down, and the proper bot multiplayer has always been kind of limited in this franchise, surprisingly, both in terms of the limited AI and, if we look at the split screen, where even smaller variants of maps end up feeling pretty empty if you dare play three or four player split screen where bots just won't show up. Yet again, a lot of modes and customization, hell, even maybe custom games that these games always could have had looking back, it always feels odd seeing them absent. Twisted Metal 2012 did have a website where you could upload custom skins for your vehicles, though, so that's kind of cool. Assuming that it worked, which it usually didn't, but we'll, we'll get there. Anyway, sorry, multiplayer. Barring me going onto one of the custom servers and playing against seasoned 10-plus year veterans of the game, which I can guarantee would not be fun for me, there's no way for me to express the multiplayer as it was versus as it was intended. I can say that I actually liked the depth that so many of these weapons seem to show with the new alt fires and whatnot, and I definitely see where these different systems could have gelled magically in an 8v8 scenario. Plus, there's even a couple new modes. At this point, I was so desperate for any new things in Twisted Metal, and playing King of the Hill, where if you're outside of the hill zone, you take damage like you're at a Battle Royale game, I I'll take it. And actually, you know what? That worked well enough that a Twisted Metal Battle Royale would not be the worst thing in the world. I don't like saying it, but it's true. There are so many little tweaks and changes that I'm genuinely a little bit sad that the game died before it had a chance. Although when I'm talking about this game's death, surprisingly, not sales-wise. It actually pulled 100,000 pre-orders about six months before release, which is a pretty good attach rate for pre-orders of an exclusive game. And the attach rate was at least on par for the series after launch, even down to the European sales not quite landing because this game just looked like more of the same twisted metal that players there never seemed to quite latch onto, rather than something new that could turn their heads toward the series. Instead, Twisted Metal 2012's death came due to two fatal flaws. A, by this point, there were already so many different crowds of TM fans that were looking for often diametrically opposed things out of their game. Some wanted the single-player lore and story that they could put together. Others wanted a deep online experience. Others wanted a dark and gritty game. Some wanted a simpler pick-up-and-play game that had depth underneath. And once your series starts running into that problem, it can be the biggest grave that you just cannot dig out of, as well as B, the online flat-out did not work. Now this goes back to where I was saying things get a little bit messy, because depending on who you ask, the finger gets pointed in a few different directions. Some former members of the team in Utah have stated that the game was always a little bit doomed because of what they referred to as an absentee director in Jaffe. Remember, he was still directing these games remotely from San Diego, while Campbell was the on-site director. You can even see some of this yourself. On Jaffe's own YouTube channel, there are still several update videos that he made and uploaded himself back in 2012, even months after the game's release, 
where he was sharing updates, or lack thereof, about why you physically could not load into a match for the first couple weeks, or what he'd gathered about the connectivity issues from the team in Utah, or a list of hot fixes and fine-tuning bits to specific damage output of certain attacks or health for certain cards. This was stuff that often wasn't posted in any official capacity. You just had to know to follow the director on YouTube or Twitter to figure out why your game wasn't working, or hope it got posted on one of the small handfuls of forums dedicated to the game. It's not hard at all to imagine how difficult this would be on both sides of that screen. Directing via conference call, email, and the occasional in-person tour had to be hell without the proper tools, and having orders handed down from above with little face-to-face -face orders that, according to many of these same sources, would continually change even throughout production seemingly on Jaffe's whims, well, that can't make for a fun, creative environment either. Now, usually I wouldn't mention some of this stuff without being able to corroborate it, but years after the fact, it's always going to be he said, they said, no matter what, and between Jaffe's comments about other games shifting around a bit depending on the interview, sometimes in ways that maybe make him look a little less at fault while others taking more direct blame, and the comments from folks lower on the totem pole that likely didn't always have the full picture in view. Between all of that, my stance has been to take all of what I found on this game especially, but in general with the series, with some salt. The fact of the matter is, the thing the game was being built around for over three years did not work when it came out, and it didn't work for months, even after a six-month delay. Even if it had worked, this game was releasing a few years before the esports and streaming eras really started to take off, so whatever team depth the game may have had would have gone mostly unnoticed unless you were on those very few forums, leaving you with a game that you might try out for an hour and then get bored of because it's not really a classic-styled Twisted Metal anymore. And the dagger is that just before the game came out, after weeks of rumors, Jaffe announced that he was leaving Eat Sleep Play, and the studio was already starting to lay people off before the game even hit shelves, which is always a good sign. I'm not talking usual roll-offs, I'm talking layoffs. And pretty much everybody involved in this series' history seemed to agree that even before all of this writing was on the wall, they were all kind of done with the franchise after this. I hope down the road, uh, you know, maybe someday we'll see it made into a movie. Jaffe's reason for leaving was that he wanted to move back into local development due to the whole remote directing issue, which is totally understandable, and that Eat Sleep Play wanted to go in a different direction than he did by moving into smaller scale mobile game development, which went about as well for that studio as you can imagine. Eat Sleep Play scaled down, somehow survived making not even one mobile game per year from 2013 to 2017, and in 2017 they closed down and were absorbed into fellow Salt Lake City developer Avalanche Software, which has its own wild history that I went through in my retrospective of, of all games to reference in a Twisted Metal video, the Tack and the Power of Juju franchise. At the time of recording, Scott Campbell works at a company making gamified fitness programs. Jaffe, meanwhile, founded his own studio in 2017 that would release Drawn to Death, an online 2v2 third-person shooter. For the record, I was one of the few that actually kinda liked the game, and even I stopped playing the game after a month or so. That studio would shut down in 2018 after another project of theirs got cancelled, and Jaffe since then has spent his time streaming and making videos with the same unfiltered candor that's led to him being one of those game director auteurs with his own cult following. As for Twisted Metal, at different points over the years since 2012, Jaffe has expressed that he would not want to be the guy that has to deal with a new Twisted Metal and all of the different fan bases. Which is another reason I would never want to do. I, you think I wouldn't want to touch Twisted Metal at this point. While also then getting a little upset that nobody reached out to him when the rumor of a new game started bubbling. And as for the series itself, Twisted Metal saw some representation in 2012's PlayStation All-Stars, featuring one of my favorite stupid voiceover lines ever. Pick that up and pay for it. As well as a weird Sweet Tooth skin that's very clearly not Sweet Tooth in Starhawk when that game launched a few months after Twisted Metal PS3. The Sweet Tooth ice cream truck ended up in Rocket League a few years later, finally fulfilling Jaffe's goal of representing Twisted Metal with a high-level competitive multiplayer experience, just not one he worked on and not one he was expecting. Merch continues to pop up here and there as well, almost exclusively Sweet Tooth because he's just about the only marketable character the series has if we're being real. But as far as games go, really all we hear are rumors every few years of a new game, with the most recent at the time of recording allegedly involving the studio that made the PSVR 2 Horizon game, led by some of the leads behind Destruction All-Stars, that PS5 car combat game that Sony was actually going to try and launch at $70 before delaying it, making it free on PS Plus, and selling it afterwards for $20 because they realized there was nowhere near enough content to justify any sort of price tag. 
Before you get scared, the leads on Destruction All-Stars also worked on games like Sony's Wipeout series, some of the MotorStorm games, nothing quite as combat -y as Twisted Metal, but enough of a resume with car games that maybe it could work if the rumors are true, which they're probably not. But what could a Twisted Metal game look like nowadays? Could it work at all? Honestly, I, I think so, and I think that all the time away from the series might just be what it needed. Games have a more varied pricing model than it ever existed during the Twisted Metal franchise's run, and publishers have a greater understanding today of how to retain players on their online projects. Sure, that means in many cases a game-as-a-service model, not ideal, but a game that seeks to have the under-the-surface depth while maintaining an accessible surface works best at a low entry cost, and with new blood behind the project, we could see new modes, a stronger tutorial structure, and most importantly, a more connected online community that could find the game game via streams or Discord servers or dumb videos like this one. Now there's always the risk that the tone or the essence of the series could get botched with new blood in charge, but even the true tone of the games has changed so many times that as long as it's not absurdly wacky, I don't think that matters. And then, of course, there's the show. The trailers have ranged from pissing every single Twisted Metal fan off to looking like a stupid, fun, campy story, the likes of which you'd probably expect from some of the folks behind movies like Deadpool and Zombieland. It's a guarantee that some fans won't be happy no matter how it turns out, and I have no idea how it will turn out. Whether it'll be this surprise hit that galvanizes the rumored production of that new game, or whether it'll end up being so bad that it actually hurts the series, I have no idea. But considering that the series is, uh, dead, I'm gonna say it probably can't hurt all that much. Now, I'm releasing this retrospective intentionally before we can watch the Twisted Metal show, because I feel that for as much as I may have criticisms of the games, many of which even the series' main director recently echoed with the addition of Twisted Metal's 1 and 2 to the PS Plus catalog to coincide with that show, so hey, at least it's not just me, I also feel that I'd rather end this video on a more positive note, a more hopeful note. Just as I didn't want to dunk on the series because I personally didn't end up getting it as much as I would have hoped, I do want to leave the next chapter open because there are folks out there that really want to see this franchise continue and potentially thrive, and there's no reason to take that away. There's enough negativity already out there, that's not what I'm about. After having spent more time than I would have expected playing every game in the Twisted Metal franchise besides the Tiger Electronics one, I guess, even if I can't say I love them, I can say that I want to see what another game could look like too. I want to see what other designers' takes are on the series now that the landscape is so wildly different. After all, part of why it's so fun to look back on the histories, the stories behind our favorite games, movies, shows, books, or whatever it may be, is to get an idea of what could be. And right now, in this moment, there could be a chance at a new beginning for the series, something that, good or bad, reaches a wider crowd of fans than ever before. A word of advice, though. Just, uh, remember to be careful when you make your wish. After all, Calypso can always find a way to turn it back against you if you're not careful. Thanks for watching, and as always, until next time, stay golden. A special thanks to my wonderful Patreon supporters for making videos like this possible. Supporters like Malkavio, Karigane564, Mason Hunt, Philly D360, Phyrexian Sleeper Agent, Rodney220, The FOE3, Thomas Kuzma, and countless others. If you'd like to get early or ad-free access to these videos, merch discounts, join the exclusive Discord server, and much more, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.